Hi everybody and uh, welcome to this afternoon's exciting event. This is a soft market testing event for two London boroughs, London Borough of Haringey and London Borough of Sutton, but we'll also be talking about another London Borough towards the end of one of the presentations. Uh, we're the UK District Energy Association. We're hosting the event on behalf of the two London boroughs. The London boroughs are both members of the association as well as the procurement advisor to both London boroughs as well. So welcome, make yourself comfortable. Um, I hope you got a cup of tea if you haven't already got one. Uh, there's about 60 people on the event. Uh, in the right hand side, we've got chat and questions. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question to anybody, please put it in the question section. If you'd like to chat um, and uh, just amongst yourselves, uh, please do. And um, yeah, uh, that's uh, that's how it works. So chat for uh, the chatting, questions for questions, and we'll be having questions at the end of the event. So without further ado, I'll crack on uh, with the um, with the event. So in terms of who we are, I just thought it was worthwhile putting a couple of slides up just to explain who the UK DA is. I know there's a large number of members attending today who will be very familiar with this. But for those of you who are not members, I thought it was useful for a couple of slides just to explain who we are and uh, why we're hosting this. So we're a non-trade, not-for-profit association. We were started um, uh, about 12 years ago in 2010. Uh, by six founder local authority largely members um, and at the core of the uh, the association are the scheme developer owners and partners they're the full members of the association and around the outside are the extremely important service providers installers equipment suppliers etc uh, which go to make up the total membership and their associate members and we've got about 140 members and we've had around 27 new members in the last year uh, and all uh, major district energy schemes that are operational are represented by the UKDA in some way, shape or form. So just a second slide, just a little bit about us. So um, we offer the tools, uh, respected voice for raising concerns to the government. Um, we've got John Saunders speaking next. Um, the government base, the heat network team are uh, one of the uh, key stakeholders. Um, and uh, they're speaking after this one. I've just picked up Tom that somebody's having trouble hearing um can you just confirm that you can hear me tom please in the uh, questions or the chat good okay I, I i've got other messages saying they can hear so that's good news so we have a 50 page monthly journal we send out to all members we have an annual conference in agm and we have regular networking events and uh, innovation events uh, one of those coming up shortly is an innovation event showcase to allow members to talk to the market about innovations they're bringing forward as well as our conference that we'll be hosting in the real world um, early in 2023. We've got a feature packed website and library and um, we also promote the district energy sector through events such as Future Build 2022 which happened in March of this year and we're already launching um, in a couple of weeks uh, what the district energy pavilion will look like at future build 2023 so if you want to find out more and you're not a member please make contact we've also got a very large training register where members can put their training courses into and we give help advice and support and essentially we're a, an association that works to network members together to act as a voice for sector and to uh, work to collaborate in order to uh, grow business for our membership so moving on to the next slide so today's the event program as i mentioned a moment ago we will first hear from john saunders john is the heat network director for bays so a very key player in the heat network sector and he will talk about the uk growth opportunity so really setting the scene uh, for why uh, we're here today um, luke thomas will then take the stage luke is a principal consultant for delta t management limited an independent consultant luke is acting both for both uh, sutton and haringey in terms of the procurement process and Luke will give an overview of the procurement process. We'll then hand over to David McIntyre. David is the Managing Director for Sutton Decentralised Energy Network Limited. Sutton Decentralised Energy Network Limited, a bit of a mouthful, or SDEN, is a wholly owned subsidiary of London Borough Sutton and he will be presenting his project that he's bringing to the market which is the extension to Sutton Town Centre and then we'll be followed by Tim Starley Granger. He's the Energy Infrastructure Manager for London Borough of Haringey and he will talk about the Haringey Den programme, which is a very ambitious project to essentially put heat networks across the borough, also taking heat from an energy from waste plant to the north of Haringey. And after that, we will then follow up with questions. Please do 
ask questions in the question session. This is not like Microsoft Teams, so you won't be able to speak. But if you ask questions, for those of you who've attended UKDA events before, it works very, very well. I will be acting as chair and I'll be putting the questions to the relevant person. So that's me. Uh, nothing more I've got to say other than if you're not a UKDA member, give us a ring, drop me an email, think about joining. Um, and I'll ask Tom to pull this presentation down now. And I'll ask John Saunders to come onto the stage and to set the scene in terms of uh, the uh, national UK heat network sector. Great, over to you, John. Thanks, uh, and hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, session. Uh, yeah, as Simon said, I'm John Saunders, Project Director for Heat Networks uh, within Bayes, uh, and uh, have broad responsibility for uh, all the work that the department does trying to, to grow the sector. Uh, so whether that's uh, putting funding into the development stages of heat networks, uh, putting capital into networks to get them built, or creating the, the environment to have them regulated and grow in the future. Uh, that's kind of me and my team. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm here today to, I, I guess, uh, yeah, get, set the scene, um, why heat networks are important to, to government, uh, what I think the growth opportunity looks like, why I think that growth opportunity is of interest to you, uh, and uh, why I think that actually the, these two projects you know, come to market in this way uh, is going to be really valuable uh, and some of the things that I think that that's going to be able to unlock. So, uh, you, know, you know, some of you will have um, seen these kind of slides before, uh, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't be here if there wasn't a kind of strategic rationale. And that strategic rationale is that, uh, you know, as, as government, we've uh, signed uh, into law uh, our net zero targets uh, and, uh, in fact, our new PM, uh, stood at the uh, dispatch box uh, a couple of hours ago uh, and recommitted to those net zero 2050 targets. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, uh, in terms of the way that we're going to get there, we've made some great inroads in terms of uh, clean electricity, you know, offshore wind, uh, solar being two big success stories to date. Uh, but it's, it's broadly accepted that uh, we're... Uh, starting to lag behind where we're going to need to be in order to get down to that net zero, uh, net zero target. Uh, and actually, if you start looking at those areas uh, where we still need to do a lot more, um, uh, decarbonising industries, a, a big sector, uh, the continued decarbonisation of transport is, is clearly a big part, but actually the real big part is, uh, is heating, uh, and specifically in heating, as we can see in this graphic on the screen, it's the decarbonisation of heating in buildings. And so this is really the, the next big transition that we need to need to get to grips with. And yeah, many of you will be familiar with some of the ways that we can decarbonise our buildings. Of course, energy efficiency is going to play a crucial role, uh, but we suspect that most buildings will still need some kind of heat and cool. Uh, and yeah, broadly, we've got uh, two pathways open to us. Uh, we've got uh, electrification or we've got some kind of green gas, including hydrogen. But actually, the thing that, that connects both of those is the ability of heat networks to operate in, in both of those potential futures and supply anywhere between 20, 10 and 20 percent of heat to uh, a range of buildings yet in the future. Uh, and yeah, that's clearly a, a massive increase from uh, you know, the 3% of heat that's currently delivered through heat networks today. So we, we don't uh, just like heat networks for the, the sake of them. Um, you know, they offer us a, a huge amount of things. So I've mentioned one of those things, which is the ability to switch between these, uh, these different future uh, environments in terms of electrification or hydrogen. Uh, but we really see a benefit of them being able to unlock these large scale, low carbon sources of heat that you just wouldn't do it at a building level scale. Uh, and of course, you know, as we move to more integrated, smarter systems, uh, anything that is able to operate in a more flexible way is going to be able to bring huge benefit to the, the overarching energy system as a whole. And you know, heat networks do that uh, in, in spades. Uh, and then the final thing is, of course, uh, if we're building assets, there's a huge investment, jobs and growth opportunity for, for UK PLC. Uh, and 
uh, you know, industry have have kind of taken our ambition and uh, uh, and kind of come back to us with what they think the scale of the opportunity is, and uh, yeah, they think that it's somewhere between 60 and 80 billion of investment that's likely to be required between now and 2050. And if we just unpack that to make it a bit more relevant for the sort of types of businesses that might be on the call today, uh, you know, we we see uh, capital going into uh, energy centres and kits. We see it going into the networks and you know the, uh, the the civils, and we see it going into the kind of, kind of consumer space or in building and, and HIUs that sort of thing. And if we unpack that kind of sixty to eighty billion figure, you know, we think there's something like uh, about twenty two billion uh, opportunity for energy centre and plant, about twenty five billion for sort of the network, the infrastructure, and about thirteen billion for uh, kind of in building and at building uh, kit. So wherever you are in in that kind of supply chain, whether you do it all or you do, do part of it, I think there's a really exciting opportunity there for you. Uh, and if we just kind of move to the top right of this slide, uh, this gives a sense. You probably won't be able to see all these little black dots, uh, but these are these are project pipeline uh, locations to give you a sense of uh, both you know, what you might be accessing if you were to uh, bid in and win on these projects in London, which is the kind of bit that's been exposed out on the right, uh, but also in the fact that actually if you're, if you're in the UK and you're operating in this environment, there's a, a plethora of other projects uh, going to be coming to market, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, so we recognise that we, uh, you know, we really like heat networks, we want to see them built, uh, but there are some uh, ongoing and persistent challenges to having them built. And I just wanted to quickly talk through some of the things that we're trying to do to uh, to aid the growth of the market. We're committed and we want the market to be committed too. Uh, so from 2013, uh, my heat notice delivery units has been supporting projects across England and Wales with early stage revenue support uh, to try and uh, get these projects identified and, and developed to such an extent that someone can decide to invest in them. Uh, whether that's uh, local authority, as in the case uh, that we're talking about today, or in fact, increasingly uh, other private sector uh, owner operators. We've seen that uh, heat networks are uh, economic, but not necessarily always commercially viable in terms of meeting the kind of returns that uh, a range of people would need. Uh, and so broadly, uh, since 2017, we've had a, a range of capital support mechanisms in the heat network investment project. Uh, and now the Green Heat Network Fund, which broadly looks to do the same thing, which is put uh, capital grant funding uh, into projects to increase the rate of returns uh, and get people investing in them. Uh, the, the latest Green Heat Network Fund uh, tries to accelerate the shift to some of those large scale, low carbon sources of heat that I mentioned on a previous slide. Uh, but otherwise it's a long-term commitment for us to uh, really uh, jumpstart the market recognizing that um, there's a lot of heat networks out there already and some of them don't perform as well as they should we've also got a, a small efficiency scheme which looks to make those improvements in these networks uh, and uh, pave the way for more low carbon uh, plant in the future uh, and this all sits as part of a, a wider uh, support package where we've got market development and growth opportunities um, looking at innovation and skills and investment and supply chain uh, pitch, uh, but also looking at how we create the regulatory environment for heat networks and then bring certainty in the growth of networks through our new heat network zoning policy. Uh, and the, the latter of those two are all going to be included in the Energy Security Bill, uh, which has been introduced to Parliament uh, a couple of months back. So we're, we're locked in for growth uh, in the UK. Uh, now, We've got huge aspirations in terms of uh, the number of heat networks that we expect to be built. Uh, we've got a, uh, a solid uh, domestic supply chain capable of delivering uh, work at the moment, uh, but we need more of it. Uh, and I guess that's the, the the main point of this slide is to give some sense of uh, how we're going to have to increase the capacity right the way across the sector in order to meet uh, our growth projections. Uh, in a way that ensures that heat networks remain uh, cost competitive, uh, that we maintain the quality of, of those uh, to deliver the benefits that we want, uh, and of course, deliver them in the timeframes that we need in order to deliver net zero. Uh, and so 
again, I think this is really speaking to the opportunity as we see it. Uh, if you're in the marketplace already, uh, then we think there's a, a compelling reason to, to grow. Uh, if you're not in the market already, I think there's a compelling reason to enter. Uh, and the top right, now I'm looking at it, is probably a bit small, sorry. Uh, but again, just kind of you know, our view of the sort of segmentation of the market. A lot of work goes into you know, the design build operate space, um, you know, either as a package or, or, or slightly unbundled. But actually, you know, if you've got this kind of market growth, there's going to be growth regardless of whether you sell plants or kit, uh, you know, widgets, uh, you know, chemical solutions, or you do the whole the whole shebang. So I think it's really important to, to kind of think about where you are in the market and, uh, and what this kind of growth might mean for you and your business. And so um, on to uh, the, the two projects today. Um, look, you've got the, um, the respective leads from those projects, so I'm not going to talk about the specifics of them. Um, but quite often, um, you know, I'm told that uh, every project's different uh, and uh, it's all kind of bespoke. And so actually, I just thought I'd try and pull out some of the similarities between these projects, because uh, I do think there's, there's more uh, connecting them uh, than differentiates them. Uh, you know, they're, they're both uh, large schemes, well above the historic size that's come to market which, as I mentioned, there's kind of in the sort of 12 to 15 million pound range. We're seeing much larger projects uh, come to market. So these aren't outliers, uh, but I think they're at the, the start of a trend of bigger projects coming to market. Uh, we've got schemes with uh, you know, multiple supplies, uh, connection to large energy for waste plants. Um, Haringey, we've got several you know, really exciting developments. Sutton, we've got decarbonisation of a whole town centre. Uh, so really interesting opportunities but again there's a, a connection between the two both councils are seriously committed you can see that by their intent to engage today um, with aspirations to you know, to own these networks uh, Sutton you know has already got a network they've already got uh, SDEN as, uh, as Simon mentioned uh, and both of them have got staffed up client teams so you've got intelligent clients to be able to engage with right from the get-go uh, and they've had long-term government support. Uh, you know, we've been working with Haringey since 2014. Uh, there's a whole load of uh, heat network investment project funding into a range of projects within Haringey, and we've been working with Sutton since 2013, and they've successfully received early stage funding for our Green Heat Network Fund. So we think these are good local authorities, and we think they're good projects. Um, I think what it represents are, are two committed and, and well-resourced councils with a high chance of progression uh, for strategic scale heat networks in our, our cities, in our capital. I guess just thinking about, um, you know, well, why it's important to us, you know, why we're here today as, as Bayes. Um, we, I talked a little bit about the, the capacity gap as we see it, but actually there's, there's also something around how we drive this kind of industrialization of heat networks uh, and move away from uh, an individual project focus uh, to being able to deliver at scale. Um, and I won't talk through uh, you know, the, the boxes on this, this, um, this diagram, but you know, broadly speaking, we see that these kind of projects uh, coming to market you know, at the same time, albeit in, in different separate procurements, enables uh, us to more quickly accelerate from the kind of the bottom left of this table into the, not the top right, but certainly in that direction. Uh, and I think some of the reasons for that are, you know, you've got two large projects, They're, they've got broadly similar structures, broadly similar aspirational delivery models. Uh, they're both London boroughs, they're, they're geographically proximate. Uh, you've got great access to, to talent and logistics for the capital uh, and actually the ability to, to align these programmes uh, so that you make best use of the resources that you've got deployed you know, in, in that location. Uh, I know both councils are open to delivering better outcomes. In fact, the you know, the pin that went to market had several pages uh, asking how we could do this better. So I know that they're open to, to doing things in a different way and, and driving those better outcomes. I think there's some efficiencies for you for, for bidding you know, at scale. You, know, you have a big bid team and there's an, enough similar things about these projects that I think you can drive some efficiencies there. Uh, and also start to think about how you spread your, your risk across uh, across projects, even though they'll be separate contracts. 
And then finally, this is for you and for us. Uh, we hope that the size of this investment really enables you uh, to sort of jump your business uh, and kind of future-proof your business and to make you more competitive uh, in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your time and uh, I'll see you uh, during question time. Brilliant. Thanks very much indeed, John. Much appreciated. Thanks very much for giving an overview of the UK sector, base support and where base see the sector growing. And I think some really important messages there in terms of the growth that Bayes expects to see over the coming years in the sector and also in the uh, supply chain as well. So Tom, if you don't mind removing um, John's uh, presentation uh, and we can pull Luke's one up onto the screen. I'll invite Luke Thomas uh, from Delta T to come on the stage. And Luke will be talking through the procurement process that is going to take place for both the Sutton and the Harrogate projects because Luke is acting for both of those um, clients. Um, so well, we're just waiting for Luke to join the stage. Here, here Luke is. I just wanted to reiterate, uh, please don't forget to ask questions in the uh, questions part of the, uh, the tab to the right hand side because there will be a chance to ask questions at the end. And that's not just questions to Luke talking about the procurement process or to Tim or to David talking about the particulars of their projects is also to John Saunders as well. Um, and it might well be that a number of you have burning questions to ask uh, following uh, John's presentation. So please do ask the questions there. So thanks very much indeed. Uh, over to Luke. Thank you, Luke. Okay, thank you, Simon. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. I know I was a bit quiet when we did the test, so shout in the comments if you can't can't hear me at all. Um, but yeah, um, okay, a lot of thumbs up, so that's good. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to cover the board um, aims of our soft market testing and a bit about the um, procurement process that we'll be um, proposing to put out, but again, asking for your feedback on. Um, Simon did do a very brief introduction of myself, um, but for those that don't know me on the call, so I've, I've got a fairly long experience in um, developing and, uh, and uh, delivering district energy schemes in in uh, city centres, so fairly large scale, and most importantly, is they um, procuring those elements as well. So, um, so that's what I'm uh, I'm doing here today. And the slides aren't moving on for me for some reason. Tom, are you able to move a slide on? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I, th I think it would just be good to set the scene and for everybody to understand why we've launched this um, soft market testing process. I mean, some of it, it will be. Uh, Will be fairly obvious but of course we want to raise the awareness of this project or these projects in Haringey and Sutton uh, not just in the UK but also for our European partners as, as, as um, John has already covered there's um, a, a um, escalation of opportunities arising and, um, and there may be other um, organizations abroad that may want to start becoming involved and um, also launching this soft market testing now, we wanted to um, inform the market of our plans and make sure that everybody's got plenty of time to gear up for what might, for some people, be larger projects. And also, if you're considering any joint ventures, um, then you've also got time to, um, to, to figure those out. Um, of course, we want to communicate our current proposals and then that will enable you guys, the market, to give your feedback and we can understand whether we're going out with the right structure and format of procurement and, and the different details of the projects. Um, so um, I'll be covering some of the questions that we're asking a bit later and the, um, and the feedback we're asking for. And um, just to confirm, so just a bit of admin here, so this isn't part of a formal procurement process and selecting organisations that we want to work with, this is uh, merely a data gathering exercise for us and uh, and for you guys and um, if you can move on a slide please tom um okay so um uh, sorry uh, i think simon's just posted it's an arrow i can't see the uh, can't see the arrow apart from a leave i definitely don't want to press that one um so we're aware that people attending the event today um, may not necessarily be delivering the works, as in there may not be civil contractors or people uh, building energy centres, etc. But um, it, but you may well have products that you'll be feeding into these these works, and we're aware that you may have connections with other organisations in the UK and abroad as well. So um, we we do encourage you to pass on 
the details of this soft market testing exercise and these projects. And of course, if you do get them involved and, and you're already partnering or supplying to them, then there's more chance that you'll um, supply your products into the event. Sorry, I still can't move on. Sorry, sorry, guys. Um, so a bit more about the um, procurement now. So in um, in essence, what the project will be trying to do is getting the design to a REBA 3 baseline. It won't necessarily be a strict baseline, but that's the uh, that's the approximate area of most of the design will, will be raised to before we're going out to um, procurement. And just to clarify that the two um, boroughs are not currently looking at a joint procurement. It's just a joint soft market testing right now. Um, that's not to say it couldn't happen, but right now we're just looking at, at two separate procurements, one for each um, authority. Um, <clears throat> so also we're looking at the um, utilities contracts regulations, uh, which is a procurement that Sutton carried out before successfully under the um, utilities contract regulations, and it will probably be following that template. Um, so just to cover a bit about the um, outline structure of the procurements that both authorities are looking at at the moment, it would be a two-stage tender. So stage one would be against the um, authority's initial information that they, um, that they put out to tender, and they would be asking for um, binding responses to those. Um, in the uh, in the probably unlikely event that everything um, is all in order in the in the first attempt, but it's um, it's expected that the um, dialogue period will be needed, and and will be helpful at least um, to um, refine various areas which I've included on the page there. J just an example that there, there will be other areas, but certainly risk allocation will be a key one. Who is best placed to take the risk? and um, what offers best value for the uh, for the project. And um, yeah, so there'll be routes to the network, there'll be initial routes, but we'd be welcome to obviously comments and thoughts on those things that, that will bring uh, better value to the project. Um, any other cost improvements? And then of course there's commercial terms for the contracts as well, which I'll be covering shortly. And I say, I'm sure there will be uh, many other points to cover and then once the uh, dialogue period has finished, there will be a second stage of the tender, which will be a final tender return. And then we would look to a point following that uh, that final second stage. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. OK, a brief bit about the contracts. So um, Esten uh, Sutton uh, su um, successfully used a uh, JCT major projects contract for the um, delivery of their first phase. So at present, uh, we'd be looking to use that again. However, the purpose of this soft market testing process is to get people's views. And that's just one area that we'd like to understand whether, um, whether the market would be happy with that type of contract, whether there's other contracts they would prefer to see and what the benefits of those might be. And um, a key element of the contracts that's worth noting is the um, notice to proceed. Um, so following uh, following stage two of the procurement, so an award would be made, but works wouldn't start um, because they would be subject to a um, notice to proceed. And um, essentially, the um, the um, procurement is part of the um, full business case process and achieving that. Um, so works wouldn't be able to start until that full business case has been signed off. So there would be a 24 month period included within the contract in which that notice to proceed can be um, enacted and um, at that point the works would start and um, we're accepting obviously there could be a, a, a gap in there and um, and particularly in, in current markets we need to make sure that there's a fair um, indexation mechanism in there so we're very open to thoughts and um, and uh, ideas on on what that might look like um, okay, thank you, Tom. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, just a um, outline of the time scales. So both projects are actually looking to launch procurement at um, very similar times. So the end of the end of this year, the start of 2023. So it shouldn't be too long 
both projects are going through their preparation stages at the moment that both Tim and David um, will cover following, uh, following my presentation. Um, so the tender period, we're looking at around six to nine months, and that's um, assuming the full two-stage process with the um, dialogue in between. Um, and just to clarify the um, notice to proceed, so works wouldn't start until whenever that is um, enacted within a 24-month period. Um, and if that 24-month period does lapse, then, um, th then the contract wouldn't be awarded, but obviously that's not, um, not the intention. Um, construction period, we're looking in, in Haringey around three years and in Sutton around um, two years. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. Okay, so some of the key areas of feedback um, that, we're, that we're looking from the market from. Um, so we're aware that these are fairly large-ish um, contracts and we're looking to understand um, what the appetite is for these to be broken down into lots. That's not currently the proposal, but obviously we need to make sure that, that the authorities um, receive the competition back in the bids. Um, so we need to understand um, whether people will bid if it's a single contract or, or whether uh, if it was split into lots and what the size of those lots would need to be in order to um, to attract different players. Um, <clears throat> uh, also the risks, I mean, there's various risks around um, underground services and permissions, etc. And um, we'd like to understand um, or at least structure the project in a way that delivers best value. So we're keen to understand everybody else's thoughts on how that split might be might be best um, best structured, and and who takes the risk on various areas, and and why that would bring the best uh, value to the project. Um, <clears throat> and also, so uh, Tim and David will cover off the works that the um, authorities are, are preparing to do. Uh, in readiness for the launch of the um, DMB um, procurement, and um, we're keen uh, keen to understand if those works are considered adequate for the risk to be understood and the extent of the works to be understood, and um, if you have any feedback um, in those areas. And um, particularly, as I already mentioned, the indexation proposals for the um, notice to proceed. Uh, to make sure this is a fair contract. And I say that may be a, a tricky point in this market, but it's something that we would need to get right. Um, so we'd um, really like to understand your thoughts there. Um, and I think as I've also mentioned about the um, appetite for consortiums to bid, um, bid for the works. Um, so next slide, please, Tom. Okay, so the next steps um, so if you are interested to help us and shape the procurements, um, then the soft market testing document that is already on the portal and you should have received has a set of questions. And the questions are also in a separate word format for ease. So um, we're asking any organizations to fill in whichever questions you would like to fill in and provide us with the information. We appreciate, appreciate that some people may not be able to fill all of them in. So those are due back for the 18th of um, September. And we are also offering the opportunity of private meetings if you think it would be helpful to discuss the um, responses to the questions and um, any other elements of our soft market testing. Okay, next slide, please, Tom, which I think is the last one. Yeah, okay, we'd also just like to highlight um, another opportunity, again, in the um, London area. So it's the OPDC project. They're um, responsible for the regeneration of an area spanning uh, three London boroughs being Ealing, Brent and Hammersmith and Fulham. Um, so again, this is a, a very large capex project across its life. So 180 million with um, 11 kilometres of network and, and a very large um, heat load. So the um, programme is due to span from 2025 to, uh, to, to um, 2040. So we have already included some information about this opportunity, which is in Appendix 1 of the soft market testing document. So do um, head down there and, and read that. And if you are interested in that project and you'd like to um, speak to the um, 
OPDC, then do share your email address through the question 17 in the questionnaire and um, they will get back to you. Um, so I think that concludes um, my part. Brilliant. Thanks very much indeed, Luke, for a very interesting presentation which ran through the procurement processes proposed. Um, so we'll now hand over to uh, David McIntyre uh, to join the stage. And David will be talking about the scheme in Sutton and we'll be bringing uh, Luke up again at the end for the Q&A section. Um, there are over 60 people in this soft market testing event, which frankly, back in the real world where we used to, uh, uh, or real life or uh, in-person events, whatever you want to call it, that we used to hold, uh, you'd be lucky to get um, a dozen, uh, maybe a couple of dozen. So because we're running this virtually, we've got a lot of people attending. It would be great to see some more questions being asked. This event is being held for you. It's not for really for our benefit. It's for your benefit to try and help us shape the procurement process or to, for the for the two clients to uh, shape their procurement process uh, to, to make as much um, of this procurement opportunity as possible for the widest possible uh, element of the market. So please do ask questions. Um, David McIntyre, are you there? If you don't mind joining the stage, that'd be great to uh, talk through your particular project. And don't forget, uh, John Saunders is here as well. So please do also ask questions of John if you've uh, got some burning questions uh, from John's presentation about the market sector. Um, and uh, there'll be a possibility to raise those uh, questions at the end that you're all putting in the uh, question section. So uh, David, I saw you earlier at the start when we had our pre-meet. Are you okay to join the stage? So David's getting ready to join, so hopefully he'll be with us in just a few seconds. So just while David's waiting to join, just a reminder about the point that Lou was talking about. Um, there is a, 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 a quite an extensive questionnaire that the two clients have assembled, or the two the two authorities have, have, have assembled, which uh, is out on the uh, procurement portal, which they're incredibly keen for you to complete. Um, that will help you to help them shape the process. I think a common complaint from uh, people involved in procurement processes is that they haven't had an opportunity to help shape the process or it came out in a way that they felt they were unable to bid for it. Um, this is your opportunity to put your, uh, your, your, your words in, your piece, your, your position, your voice uh, to help shape the uh, procurement process that's going to be taking place uh, towards the end of uh, this year. Uh, at the start of 2023. Um, so we're just um, waiting for David. I think he's having a few uh, problems. Um, uh, Tom's just trying to help him in the background. So we'll give him another couple of seconds um, for him to uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, get his IT working. So if you don't mind, bear with us for a second. Thanks very much indeed to um, Ollie, um, Andrew and Simon who've um, already posted questions, please do uh, keep them coming. Any questions, no matter how simple, are, um, are welcome, uh, because if you don't ask the question, you don't find out the answer, and then it may mean that you miss an opportunity. As Luke was saying earlier, it may well be that a lot of you on the call today actually might not tender for this or these opportunities directly, but please do consider your networks, the people that you work with, the people you to supply to, both nationally and internationally, whether any of those uh, contractors may wish to um, find out about this opportunity and uh, also uh, tender for the project. Uh, let me just see what's happening with David at the moment. Um, okay, I think uh, David's just um, struggling uh, slightly to get in. We'll give him another couple of seconds and then if David hasn't managed to join, I'll, I think we just have to step in and his presentation for him. Um, because we need to move on with the event. So apologies for this uh, slight hiccup in the IT. Uh, David was with us uh, before the meeting. Um, Okay, I think what we'll do is we will um, 
skip on. Um, and um, Tom, uh, do you want to pull down David's presentation and we'll bring Tim onto the stage and hopefully by the time that um, Tim has finished, uh, David uh, will be uh, available to come in. So we'll just swap it around. So Tim, are you okay to uh, come and join the stage, please, if, that, uh, if that's okay? Your IT is working. So hopefully Tim will be with us in just a second. Many apologies again for the IT issues. Uh, we seem to be having some problems getting David back into the, uh, the presentation software for some reason. So we'll just give two seconds for Tim, hopefully, to be able to join. Again, apologies for the, uh, the IT hiccup. Um, but if you can keep asking questions in the interim, I mean, maybe it's a handy interlude for you to be able to ask questions. Uh, we'll wait for people to join. And that's brilliant. So, uh, Tim, uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. And just to confirm, Tim, if you just hover on the right hand side of the slide on the screen, there's a little arrow yeah. that pops up. I got it. Perfect. Okay, I will leave and over to Tim Starley Granger. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, hi. So I'm Tim Starley Granger. I'm the Energy Infrastructure Manager at Harringay Council, where I manage our district heating programme, which I'll talk you through now. So you might not know where Harringay is. We're kind of zones two, three, and four of London at 12 o'clock. Uh, I could point out to north of us is Enfield. I saw someone mentioning in the chat, um, talking about Enfield's ESCO Energetic. They're an important part of our project as well. Then Sutton's down here, uh, and Fulham, Brent, and Ealing for the ODPA are here somewhere. Um, so we're, we're at uh, 12 o'clock. And John uh, was speaking very kindly about Harringay Council's um, commitment. I'll talk through some of what we've done. So the council has um, kind of a borough plan where it sets out the members vision over a kind of a four year cycle and we also have a climate change action plan the council's committed to being zero carbon by 2041 and embedded within both of those strategies is a commitment to progressing a large district heating network as john said uh, we've had um, government support for going on 10 years and uh, throughout that time we've been looking at a really big strategic kind of pan borough network um, and we're getting quite excited it's starting to get a bit real so um, the council's approved outline business cases for, for three phases of the network so an outline business case is kind of a public sector thing it's basically we've we've got a proven concept we've agreed the budget to go and go out and turn it from a concept into reality in terms of doing the procurement uh, confirming costs confirming that the market will deliver what we think they will etc um, and we've got HNIP funding is paying for some of the next phase of work but we've also got a chunk of money towards building the network um, and there is a, a large latent demand for heat networks in in Haringey through planning policy and the amount of regeneration that's going on so uh, yeah the boroughs got some big regeneration schemes. Um, there's about 12,000 new homes in, in the pipeline over the next five, 10 years, and about 4,000 are already under construction. Um, the council's got a large share in that. We're, we're hoping to build 3,000 council homes. We've got um, 1,000 new homes are, are already underway, and we've got 1,000 existing homes that are already on communal heating that we would, would join up to this network. So. Uh, a lot of this is enabled through our planning policy, where the London plan and our local planning policy basically requires all major new developments to have a single site-wide network and to prioritise off-site connection. So what that means these days is often we see planning applications coming in where developers are wanting to put in a site-wide network with an air source heat pump on site. And what we say to them is, that's fine, but you should... Uh, 
program in your energy infrastructure so that you put you, you install the, the air source heat pump at the end and in the meantime the council will is, has got this big heat network project and we will um, put an offer into you to connect to it and if it's viable you will connect and the benefit there is we kind of capture the the air source heat pump avoided air source heat pump cost as a connection charge so our planning policy is quite supportive as well and as well as the projects i will talk you through now we're planning to extend the network as well so this is sort of phases one two and three but there's phases four five six seven behind it um so this uh is maybe a bit uh poor resolution but bear with me so i'll start up in the top right hand corner so the green blob that is um where the north london boroughs are building an energy from waste plant uh and that energy from waste plant energetic uh it's in enfield and energetic enfield council desco have got an exclusive right to take heat from it and they've started building out this network in blue um that is the meridian water heat network uh which is also in receipt of hnet funding and is planning to expand into um Enfield much further than is shown on this map. Um, our network in, in Haringey is shown in, in kind of yellow with the green and orange bits. Um, and there is a sort of turquoise extension of the, the Enfield network that comes down to a red dot. So the red dots so four four energy centres dotted around our network, uh, where you can see I've kind of listed off the key plan that is in each energy centre. So that the, the first one uh, in North Tottenham and actually opposite the new Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Uh, so that will have a 20 megawatt interface with Energetic. So we're, we're buying effectively 20 megawatts of low carbon heat. And then the energy centers have got thermal stores and um, boilers to serve as top up and back up. So the, the 20 megawatt low carbon heat is kind of base load and our boiler plant will provide uh, for peaks, etc. And uh, yeah, so there's these four network, uh, four energy centres, there are, it's about 12.4 kilometres of, of network. And phase one is about 20 customers. So I saw a question in the chat about whether the scope would include in building connection works. So it, it will. So most new build developments in Haringey will have already put a pipe in from the site boundary to their uh, kind of intake room. And we would need to come in and install a, a substation so that those in building connections would be part of the scope as well. My next slide talks about the scope in more detail. But um, to give you an idea of contract value, this is sort of 70, 80 million pounds worth of uh, infrastructure. And I've talked through some of this already um, in terms of the network. Uh, the energy centres, um, some of the energy centres are being delivered by others so um the council asked developers to build energy centers for us through planning um so they tend to build a shell and core and we fit it out so that's what's happening uh hrw's high road west that is the the uh the main energy center opposite the spurs stadium in the north of the borough that's about 700 square meters and would need would be fitted out as part of the contract there was another one in Tottenham Hale in the kind of south east corner of the borough. That's about 500 square meters there. We're looking for someone to build the building and then fit it out. There's one in the center of the borough, which is a Broadwater farm. That energy center building fit out would be by others. That would just be a connection. And in Wood Green, there is an energy center under construction, which is about 1,200 square meters. That's kind of in the west of the borough. And the fit out there would be about 1,200 square meters. I've talked about the uh, 20 customer connections um, and well I think some of our questions in the procurement would be around how much of phases you know four five and six do we include in the, the tender we'd be interested to know more about that um, Luke also spoke about the um, project information we'd be able to provide and, and how we're keen to get your feedback so this slide just kind of summarizes 
that. So we're in the process of developing a model route. Um, most of it's going to be designed to kind of Reba 3. So it would just be plan with uh, a little bit of information, but we will do some detailed sections more to Reba 4. Um, so where we're doing uh, crossings of infrastructure or with um, looked at the C2s, it's, it's very uh, busy beneath the ground. We will do more detailed design, um, but we'll provide C2 data for the routes and the wider area. Um, we'll look at um, unexploded ordnance and contaminated land in a bit more detail for the route, but also for the wider area. Uh, we're looking at you know providing a, a detail a, a decent amount of um, GPR and trial pits. Um, we're very interested to understand how much GPR and how many trial pits you would want. You know, we don't want to waste a lot of money on things which are unnecessary. Uh, so it'd be good to understand what people need there. Uh, the energy centres. Uh, it would just be kind of a Reba 3 designs for the fit outs in the buildings. Uh, connection designs would be kind of Reba 3 for the majority of connections. Um, we will have planning approval for the pipe and the energy centres, but there'll be a number of other um, consents that we'll be asking the, the uh, DMB contractor to finalise. Uh, yeah, I guess I haven't said uh, we're looking more at design and build procurement. Uh, when John was talking, he was um, saying the UK market's focused on design, build, operate, maintain. We've got a separate procurement for the operation and maintenance. This is DMB focused. But yeah, going back to those approvals, it would be, you know, we might have an agreement in principle with some um, asset owners where we'd need some some further approvals and um, highways approvals are set to be, to be finalised. But we would also uh, kind of give you a detailed map setting out the constraints uh, on the project and how they might evolve over the construction period. Um, Luke was saying we're looking at a kind of 36 month construction period. So we would give you maps of where we are aware of other projects along the route that might interfere with that program of installation. and. Yeah, so we're very keen to understand if this is in line with what you would expect or if we should be. And Luke spoke already about the procurement timeline. Uh, this is what I think the Haringey one looks like. It's uh, largely in line with what Luke was talking about. The um, notice to proceed idea, though, that Luke had, I think um, we hopefully won't be looking for such a long um, period, the 24 month period might be a bit on the long side. I think uh, there are some pressures on us to get this network built, which means if we don't start in 2024, we're probably unlikely to get it built in time. So it wouldn't be a 24 month notice to proceed, but we might be looking at a 12 month one in case the, the full business case slips. So that full business case, I've already explained the outline business case gives, gives us a concept. The full business case is where we, we go back to our cabinet with kind of proof of concept. We'll have all of the construction contracts, operating contracts, um, supply agreements, connection agreements, planning consent. We'll have designed the ESCO and be able to explain to cabinet how that will work. So that's what's in that full business case. There's still quite a few moving parts um, of which the DMB procurement is one of the biggest ones, but we need to make sure they all line up before we would um, award the contract for construction. Um, but January 2024 is where we are programmed for at the moment. And I think that's all I was planning on saying. Thanks very much indeed. Much appreciated. Well, that's given a very good rundown to the, uh, the Haringey opportunity for uh, people attending the event to uh, understand. Thanks very much indeed, Tim. Thanks very much indeed to the number of questions coming in. Um, David, hopefully if you've fixed your IT problems, we can pull down the Tim's presentation and uh, we can bring David onto the stage. But David's joining us. Hopefully the IT gremlins are uh, 
resolved. If we can't see you, David, do you mind talking just so we can hear you? Have you got me, Simon? I can hear you perfectly, David. We can't see you, but I'm, as long as we can hear you, that's the main thing. Do you want to kick off your presentation and I'll, and I'll disappear off in a second once you're all good? Two seconds. Yeah, okay. Hopefully, is that okay now? Can you hear me, but not see me? Perfect. No problem at all, David. Yeah, black screen, but we can hear you perfectly. Okay. Okay. Apologies for that. The perils of IT. <laughs> uh, thanks, Simon, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm David McIntyre, and I'm the Managing Director of uh, Sutton Decentralized Energy Network, or SDEN, to keep it nice and brief. Um, I'm going to spend the next few minutes providing an overview of the Sutton Heat Network in its present form, and also the Council's aspirations for uh, future growth and expansion into Sutton Town Centre. So as an introduction, uh, SDEN is a low carbon heating network that was established in uh, 2016 and is a standalone company which is wholly owned by Sutton Council. The network is being constructed in two phases and phase one of the build began in 2017 uh, which is a residential development in Hackbridge, Sutton and it's called New Mill Quarter. Uh, the full build out of the development will be completed in spring 2023 uh, and when completed will comprise uh, 805 residential dwellings and these are a blend of houses and apartments and also a small number of retail units which we have on site uh, and these include a little store. Esten has a long-term partnership with Virador uh, to supply the heat and as a fairly unique heat source, it doesn't rely on the, on, on, the, on backup gas boilers. So we do consider ourselves to be very well protected uh, in terms of resilience. For phase one, our primary heat source is being provided by two uh, 600 kilowatt gas engines. Uh, and these are sited on the Beddington landfill gas site in proximity to the Virador Beddington Energy from Waste Plant. We then have an energy sensor situated on the development with backup resilience of six megawatts of boiler capacity and a quarter of a million liters of thermal stored water. So plenty of backup resilience for the current development and heat load. Um, the landfill gas site is forecasted to deplete in a small number of years and this, this will correlate with a full transfer connection across to the Virador Beddington ERF which will then provide an available capacity of 15 megawatts of waste heat and this will also align with SDEN's expansion of the heat network. And so we've now directed our focus onto the next stage of our development and the council is fully committed to the decarbonisation of the borough and so SDEN is now exploring the opportunity to extend the heat network into Sutton Town Centre. In terms of the steps that we've taken so far, um, a GLA funded study uh, was commissioned back in 2019, uh, which provided us with heat mapping and a district heat master plan uh, study for the town centre. And this identified both existing and future heat loads available to us. And this was also coupled with some detailed route mapping. Uh, the conclusion was the optimum solution for decarbonisation was to extend the current heat network from the Hackbridge site. In 2020, a further GLA funded study uh, was undertaken to explore this in more detail. Um, however, the study was hampered by COVID restrictions at that time. And so progress was halted um, at that point as it purely became too difficult to extract the granular detail of heat loads uh, that was required for the project to move forward. So then moving forward into December of last year, 2021, SDEM was awarded grant funding through the Green Heat Network Fund Transition Scheme um, to develop the heat network expansion designs, which will identify the capital costs of the new connections. And this will subsequently allow us to form then form a full business case. And we've currently identified circa 50 building sites that we believe can benefit from the heat network connection. And these are a mix of core buildings and also future regeneration projects that the council is currently exploring. Um, and if the full potential of the heat network is realized, then we do forecast in excess of 3000 tons of carbon savings uh, per year. 
So this next slide provides uh, an overhead view of what we are uh, seeking to accomplish. And uh, I do apologize if this looks small on your screens, but I will try my best just to walk you through the route that's currently proposed. I do see that Tom's alluded to the slides being shared after the event, so that should help. Um, so just for reference, um, the orange buildings um, are, are existing structures and the, the green buildings represent future redevelopment areas. Um, so starting from the top, so if you look at the top right of the, of the, uh, the route plan, this is the existing Hackbridge site, which is marked Felnex as the, it's just because the new residential uh, development is built on an old uh, Felnex, it's called the old Felnex uh, industrial estate. And the route length is approximately two and a half miles from the Hackbridge site uh, down into the town center. And so we would like to pick up some heat, uh, some heat load along the way. Uh, which is where we've identified a, a cluster of potential connections, which in, includes some existing schools, uh, a retirement home, um, some former council offices that, uh, that are planned for redevelopment into residential dwellings. And then the network will then continue uh, into the town centre, which is where we will then capture the large majority of the heat load and construct a backup energy centre at a strategic location. Uh, this graphic provides um, with some, some closer detail uh, with regards to the town centre layout where we would also need to construct the backup energy centre um, to include the boil, uh, to include boilers uh, and also thermal storage and obviously this will provide us with the resilience of the, the resilience of the heat supply. Uh, we do have uh, we've identified a favoured location for the energy centre. And we are actually currently working through the draft design layout at this moment in time. So in terms of the journey uh, that we've been on for the last 12 months, this is the position that we are currently at. Um, so funding was secured from Green Heat Network Fund in December of last year, uh, which allowed us to launch a, a, um, a procurement process to onboard a design consultancy. Um, and this was achieved in April of this year, um, where we subsequently started to undertake the major design works. We currently forecast to have uh, enough design detail to enable us to release an invitation uh, to tender for interested DMB companies uh, by no November of this year. And this will include a uh, model route design to Reba Stage 3, um, C2 data for the route in the wider area, GPR for pinch points along the route, um, Reba 3 EC designs for plant rooms and energy centre, and also consumer connection designs to Reba 3. And tender returns are uh, due to be, well, we forecast tender returns for return by around April of, of next year. So that will then allow us to start building our techno-economic models uh, and sub-business cases for the summer of, of 2023. Uh, where we can then present to council for full consideration of the project. And finally, if council approval is obtained, then uh, we will then proceed to move forward with a contract award uh, with the su successful contracting party. Um, as a footnote, these aren't these timelines are not specifically set in stone, uh, but these are the projections that we're currently working towards at this point in time and would like to hold to these timelines. So, uh, so that's a broad overview of the STEM business, um, and I hope it provides people with a, a little more insight of the, the company in its current form um, uh, and what we're looking to achieve over the next few years. And on that note, I will hand back over to Simon. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much indeed, David. Um, much appreciated. Uh, Tom, if you don't mind uh, removing the... Uh, excellent. Thanks very much indeed. We'll leave David on the screen, unfortunately. He's, uh, camera's not working but um we uh, we'll, we'll work with that um and if i can invite the other speakers to um come on back onto the stage we will work through the uh the, the questions um so hopefully that's uh, john tim and luke if you don't mind coming back onto the stage that would be very helpful please and we'll work through the questions please keep the questions coming in we'll we'll keep running through the questions until um, we get to four o'clock or until um, we see that uh, all of you are disappearing because you've got other meetings and events to go to.
So, uh, John and Tim, if you don't mind joining the stage, if you can, please, that would be super. Thank you much indeed. Give me a couple of seconds. I think Tim's just joining, and I think John's just joining as well. Superb. Thanks for coming back, John. And we'll just wait for, for Tim to come on as well. So while we're waiting for uh, Tim, I'll, uh, there we go, brilliant, right, cool, excellent stuff. So the first one, which is already answered, will slides be available so I'm, uh, for speakers? I scrolled right down to the bottom of the question se section so you can read uh, the, the speaker, the, uh, the questions. So Simon Edelston's has been responded to, so it's fairly straightforward. Um, Ollie Abrahams, the scope of the work boundaries. Um, Luke, did you want to just cover the scope of the work boundaries question, please? Because I think you're best place to do that for both projects. Um, yes, I think um, Tim did cover this to some extent. I'll just find the um, exact question. Um, yes, yeah, so secondary connections. I mean, in terms of development sites, it may not include the secondary networks on the development sites, but it would include the primary heat exchanger to that site um, and for individual building connections then yes it would definitely include the heat exchanger to the site and what, particularly where they're not some um, new developments there might be some modifications to the heating systems to ensure that they're compatible with the main heating system so um, yes essentially where necessary that extent will change but yes definitely there will be some local works on site Okay, so secondary network connections are included, uh, which includes thermal substations for building connections. Okay, that's pretty clear. So the next one up, we've got Andrew Wetton's question, which is um, uh, an intriguing question, a, bit, a little bit left field, um, uh, and maybe one for John to even contemplate. So the question is, will the councils join together to form a single ESCO to own and operate the schemes outside the local authority like Enfield? I don't think currently that either of the local authorities are um, planning to go outside of their boundary. And I don't think either of the local authorities are planning to join together to uh, form a single ESCO. But the ESCO will have control of the total network. Um, Tim and or David, did either of you want to talk about your, your approach to a local authority ESCO within your, uh, within your particular boroughs? I'll, I'll take that from, from my angle, if you wish. Um, it, it's not something that's been looked at, and I think the, I would personally... Sorry, you broke that. Oh, sorry, Tim. I think David had jumped in and was responding. Tim, unless you can, can you hear him? Tim? Oh, I was going to, uh, do you want me to, I'll go first, Tim. Go, go, go for it, David, and we'll assume that Tim understands that you, were, you jumped in. <laughs> I, I think the complexities would be too great in all honesty. Um, I, 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 you know, I can't answer for Haringey, uh, but in terms of Sutton, I think uh, both, I think that, that, you know, certain in terms of the council and the local authorities, I, I think the objectives, I don't think they're aligned, um, but um, it may be a conversation for future, who knows? Okay, J John. I'm conscious that a lot of these questions are aimed at the specific scheme developers, but I thought that might be something that you might have a view on about uh, local authorities joining together to form single ESCOs and whether you think that's something that might happen as we industrialise heat networks across the UK. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think um, given the fact that we're looking for more strategic networks that you know, don't really care so much about um, you know, political boundaries, um, and are much more driven by uh, the economics of connecting loads. I, I definitely think that um, you know, there's going to be the potential for uh, you know, multiple public and private sector ownerships into single sort of delivery vehicles, ESCOs, um, uh, and, and even uh, some of the things that we heard about you know, from, um, you know, from Luke earlier, where he was trailing the, you know, the West of London option. You could well see you know, those three organisations in some way coming together into a kind of connected large-scale scheme. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it is very probable. Cool. Excellent. Okay, now that's quite clear. Um, so the next one, Luke, I was going to put over to you. 
um, on behalf of both the uh, organisations. So will there be an opportunity? So this is one from Simon Edelston. Will there be an opportunity to provide longer term contract energy management for the scheme? So it's metering and billing, operation and maintenance. I, I think the answer is most probably no, because or, or and or under separate procurements, because this is just a DMB contract. But did you want to cover that one, Luke? Um, yes, essentially, you're correct. Obviously, those schemes do need those services, but uh, they're, they're being procured separately um, to this. So, um, yeah, and, and they're, they're different for each of the authorities as well. So that's um, a, a less common area. OK, cool. That's good. Thanks very much indeed. Um, we've got the procurement one, which you've answered the procurement portal. So that's for everybody to see the one from Ollie Abrahams. Okay, so just to um, interject there, that you can go on the general portal. So if you go on con on pro contract and pull in pull down the London Borough of Sutton opportunities, you can search and find it another way. But the uh, link that I included there should take you directly to the right place. Okay. Um, uh, again, Tobias uh, Prewitz has asked about the heat offtake for the EFW plants itself. So the actual the heat recovery equipment in the heat recovery plants. And Luke, again, on behalf of both authorities, did you want to cover that? Would that be best? Um, yeah, so I just need to double check that question. Uh, I think the answer is no, the heat recovery equipment is being put in by um, the a third party or the plant owner in both cases, but it'd be helpful if you could just confirm. Um, yes, essentially all of those elements will be covered off all the the technicalities of providing the heat and um, and the, indeed the heat offtake agreements would all be um, sorted separately. So that isn't something that's included, um, particularly as part of these tenders. Um, it's assumed that that heat supply is in place and the temperatures are known and everything is designed around that. Okay. Uh, the next one up, if you just scroll up, uh, Luke, uh, I think this is definitely one for you. Um, Michael Goman is just introducing himself as a business um, and we we'll very much appreciate face to face meeting. Clearly, this is not the place to ask for that. Could you just remind people on the call how they would request a face to face meeting under this procurement process, please? Um, yeah, it's actually one of the questions. So the separate questionnaire is also part of the main document, but the separate questionnaire has been included as a separate document on the portal. So it's easy to fill in and, and um, respond to. But one of the questions, one of the final questions in there is, would you like to request a meeting? So if you fill in that question, when you submit your questionnaire, we will know and we can get back in contact with you. Cool. OK, lovely. Thanks very much. And uh, Luke, sorry to focus on you. I'll come back to Tim and David and John in a minute. But Paul Leatherbarrow, um, an overall scope map. Um, is, is there anything else in addition to what you've already put out to the market or would you direct Paul to what's been put out in the market already? Um, I think that was possibly in response to when Tim giving his presentation. I think that one popped up and an overall scope map. If it was referring to the map on the screen, then everybody would get the presentations. Um, if it's something else, then I think we would need to know. OK. Um, the next one up, uh, so uh, Paul, I think the, 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 the good way to do that is to put that in the, in the questions um, in response to the soft market testing questionnaire. If you feel that more information would be helpful to allow you to understand the opportunity, that's certainly a reasonable request. Um, uh, John, um, I, 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 as you're here, there's an interesting question from Stuart Martin uh, about um, businesses trying to enter the UK market um, and banks not uh, providing the funds because we don't match their profiles. I don't know whether there's anything you can respond about. I'm not sure that the uh, the, the, the councillors themselves could do anything to uh, change the position of specific contractors. Is that anything you could comment on or do you think it's not something that Bayes could uh, introduce? It's about getting new contractors access to markets. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess it, it depends uh, what the, the particular barrier is. I think the um, the key thing would be to uh, introduce uh, any new entrants to my colleagues uh, in a, a separate department um, and see what uh, kind of soft landing support we can provide. Uh, if you're a, a kind of foreign direct investor, if you're not you're someone in the UK, uh, then uh, doing introdu introductions to the British Business Bank 
I think would be the the kind of most helpful uh, avenue. Um, but I'm I'm happy to sort of take the question away and, and maybe I don't know Simon if you're planning on uh, sending a sort of consolidated Q and A pack after this. But I'm happy for that to be sent as part of the slides or whatever. Yeah, no, absolutely. We will we will be downloading all the questions into an Excel spreadsheet, asking the speakers to respond where uh, we've identified it's for them, and uh, then uh, circulating that to everybody attended. Uh, so the next one up, um, uh, Tim, as uh, sorry, uh, Luke as uh, Tim and and or David uh, um, may want to come in afterwards. But so is Ria's question. The next one down to the council that contract to secure easements with third parties if we're required to pass through third party land. I think most probably most of the works are being undertaken in the uh, in the public highway. But Luke, uh, did you want to cover that, or should we pass over to Tim and or David? Uh, well, my understanding, they can correct me if this is wrong, is that any third party rights would be secured, but we'd be uh, obviously avoiding third party land um, wherever possible. But if there are any of those um, rights and easements needed, then we'd look to secure those prior to the tender being launched. Okay, that makes sense. Tim, I'm conscious your video is disabled due to bandwidth, it tells me. Are you there at all, Tim? Uh, no, nope, we'll assume Tim has unfortunately got IT problems, so he's disappeared. Um, uh, next one up is Fei Zhang. Luke, what other options do you have apart from JCT? Um, uh, are there any others you're considering at the moment, or really? Yes, some Oh, sorry, Me. Tim. Sorry, Tim. I think we're struggling to hear you. Shall I fold your head yeah. and answer the yeah. contract? Yeah, question? I fold your head and answer the JCT question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, we are considering other contracts not i'd say too seriously at this point in time because we'd like to see what the market thinks but there's other contracts icc ice um nec and fidic uh, various other forms that we can can and yeah and will potentially consider it if if need be so um, if you do have any feedback on that that would be useful okay so essentially uh feedback to the soft market questionnaire please uh, John Sanderson's questions again. Sorry to hog you, Luke, but I think this most probably would uh, cover. So, uh, do you is it your understanding that either of the local authorities is currently considering purchasing the pipework and then free issuing that to the DMB contractor? I think the primary solution is most probably not, but most probably something to put forward as a as an option in the soft market testing questionnaire. What any thoughts, Luke? Um, yes, again, I think diff the different authorities might take a different approach to that. Um, so, it would, again, it would be useful to understand how that might affect your thoughts on the procurement and uh, on the works, whether it's, you know, a problem either way, then um, do let us know. Okay, good. Excellent stuff. Tim, I see you've uh, come back in the room, which is excellent, uh, just in time. So there's a question for John Sanderson. Could you please clarify the planning condition if viable you will connect um are you okay to to respond to that one tim oh no you you're on mute at the moment tim sorry you're off mute did you want to speak can you hear me now I hear you perfectly yeah do you want to go ahead yeah, sorry, my internet's playing up. Uh, yeah, so um, it's mainly uh, large new build developments where we put planning conditions, uh, planning obligations in place for a developer that says they will connect to us if we give them a reasonable offer. So there's kind of viability test in there in terms of the price of energy, the connection charge, the commercial terms, the standards of service and guarantees as long as, as long as all of those are acceptable the developer is obliged to connect um so yeah a number of networks um in london use that successfully to grow um we would use it uh, to get our initial customers but it's uh, it's a sound legal basis. 
Okay, Tim, can I suggest you turn off your video feed? It might be that you're suffering with real bandwidth and just join us uh, verbally. I don't know uh, that answers John's question. Uh, uh, I, th I think it does. Um, Tim, the next one from Andrew Buchanan um, is also also for you. Could you, uh, could you, are you still with us, Tim? Hello, Tim. Just while we're waiting for Tim, if I just Tim? expand it ever so slightly on the last point, um, it was just that we wouldn't expect, or let's see, my understanding that the um, developments wouldn't have fully established sort of low carbon um, heating supplies, so it wouldn't be pulling out a load of air source heat pumps to put the um, network in. There's deadlines at which they need to have the, the low carbon heat in place, and that is an either or scenario. And, and so some of the timelines are driving the network being built to reach these buildings in time. Okay, uh, um, Andrew Buchanan, Tim, sorry, you are you there, Tim? I am here, if you can hear me. I can hear you. Best keep the camera off, I think, due to bandwidth. Sounds like we're going around the far side of the moon on this one. Uh, biomass boilers. Uh, recently, we started the linker boiler in Tottenham Hale. Um, I, I guess the answer is... Um, no question mark because it's the heat source from the energy from waste but do you want to respond to that one tim i i can't see the question but we're not considering uh biomass boilers in any detail okay cool okay no that's fine i, I didn't thought that was most probably the case um judy darbature next one up loop uh planning where the system costs third-party land i presume the answers uh the same as earlier where it does cross third party land the, the authorities will generally be seeking that approval um yes but planning might be a different matter again i think the two authorities taking a different approach where um sometimes they'll be securing planning and other times it would be the dmb contractors um responsibility to finish off the planning process which will be started but not necessarily um concluded okay the next question, turnover question mark, is a bit about the briefest question I've seen, Julie. Um, I, I'm interpolating that means, will there be a turnover threshold for contractors who want to, to bid? I'm assuming that's the question. Um, Luke, any thoughts on that? Um, yes, these are public procurements, so um, it will be um, inevitable that there's a turnover test. And um, you know, this is some of the feedback that we want and you know, bearing that in mind, um, you can potentially make a self-assessment as to whether you would be able to respond to this opportunity if it was a single contract or whether it would be better split into lots and, and what size of those lots um, might be. Okay, I think that's a really important point, Julie, about the lot issue. And John, I, uh, I see you got your hand up. Please do come in. Yeah, I think just, um, again, any uh, intel from you know, those respondents to uh, the, the barriers that they'd face, you know, based on certain kind of turnover test levels, I think it would be really valuable for us to think about, you know, how we can, uh, you know, government support, uh, you know, the new entrants or smaller parts of the market coming together to, you know, to deliver bigger schemes. So I'll just a double plug for um, respondents uh, on that one, please. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, indeed, indeed. I mean, I think a really important to underline about all of this is there is a questionnaire please do take part in the questionnaire even, even if you don't think you can tender for these works anything you can give us any market information any barriers any reasons you might tender anybody you think we should be speaking to might want to tender please feed that back uh, through the questionnaire to the two uh, to uh, local authorities uh, we'll gloss over john's uh, quip about you being warm john um, and uh, we'll head on to neil's question uh, so what network temperatures are planned uh, Presumably, uh, large air and water source heat pumps were considered ruled out. Um, is there any plan to integrate these into a future uh, phase? Um, uh, Tim, um, uh, might, might be something you might want to come in of you if your bandwidth is working. Yeah, so I mean, the network connection from Energetic we're looking at is kind of 86.55. Um, then it steps down into um, different lower temperatures in various blocks. But some some of the buildings we're supplying 
need a supply temperature of about 80. Um, we have looked at uh, air source heat pumps and water source and ground source heat pumps. They would just don't compete um, economically with the energy from waste planets, which is um, a virtual heat pump uh, with a COP of about five, but you buy the electricity on the wholesale market instead of the retail market. So it's just so much more affordable. But sure. in later phases, we would add in um, additional heat pumps. So there's a number of tube ventilation shafts in Haringey that uh, TFL believe are highly um, developable, developable as heat sources. There's also the River Lee. There's um, a large uh, series treatment works right next to the energy from waste plant in in Enfield, so there's you know lots of other low carbon heat sources would be added in later phases, but I think they're kind of icing up on the cake for now. We just want to get it off the ground with the with the FW. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Um, and then finally, there's a question from John Bentel, which um, uh, David and or Tim, if you uh, can hear me and you can speak, um, there's an interesting question which I'm interpreting in this way. Will there be opportunities to adopt the ESCOs with associated complete systems to operate and maintain them over a number of years? So I think this is meaning once you've built them, will there be a chance for the private sector to come in and take over the ESCO and run them? I don't think that's the intention, uh, but Tim and or David, uh, did you want to talk about your uh, respective authorities' aspirations for future ownership of these networks or future control of these networks? Well, yeah, I mean, I can talk for, for Haringey. I mean, one of the key things that we've been asked to do all the way through is keep our exit strategy open. Um, yeah. So uh, the council hasn't ruled out exiting in the future in various ways, shapes or forms or inviting partners in. Um, but there are no plans to do that at the moment. Um, you know, the, I think from a um, political perspective, the, the uh, control of Harrogate Council's quite left-wing Labour and uh, kind of believes that energy infrastructure should be owned by the public uh, rather than the private sector. So I can't see that changing with the current control. Okay. And uh, David, to just to wrap it up, uh, if you're still there, any thoughts about Sutton's aspirations to keep owning Esten uh, and or bringing a third-party uh, operator delivery partner? Similar, I suppose, similar response to Tim, in all honesty. Um, these are large scale projects, um, which, which, which will and obviously do take some management. Um, and it's certainly, uh, it's been a point of discussion, uh, an, an early point of discussion, I will add, at this stage in time. But um, realistically, it's get these projects or, or get our project off the ground. Uh, and then we we'll see what we what they are to the possible is moving forward. Okay, cool. Excellent. Lovely. Thanks very much indeed. Well, we're getting um, lots of really good thanks from everybody we, um, for the event. So we really do hope you appreciate it. Um, we really, I really encourage you, Luke, John, Tim, David, please, please, please fill in the questionnaire. If you do nothing else for the rest of the week, take five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour, fill in the questionnaire. Whether you're going to tender for the project yourselves, you've just got some useful information from us, you want to raise barriers, as John said, or you think you know somebody you might want to tender for this, that's the purpose of reaching out and engaging with the market. Uh, and what we want to do is we don't want to end up with a procurement process where people tendering saying, why did you construct it in this way? Because we will never tender for that. If you'd have done this, we would have tendered because that's uh, what we're trying to avoid. So uh, thanks very much indeed for everybody who's attended. Uh, we, we've now reached four o'clock. I'll thank all of the speakers and I'll ask uh, Tom to bring the session to a close. So thanks very much indeed. Take care, everybody, and I uh, hope you have a good rest of the week. Thanks very much.